there you go. Well, I'm smiling, not because we're on TV, Scarlett, because I really like But our because next guest. we're on TV also. Because we're on TV together. There you go. But it's really because I like our next guest. He's a master of timing. Stocks are on a roll today. And this is a man who went from being a bear starting July 1st until yesterday when this guy became a bull. Milton Berg is CEO and Chief Investment Strategist at MB Advisors. He was shorting the market, as I said, until yesterday. All of his calls up 21.8% on the year. So we got to get his thoughts. He joins us today. Milton, let's actually go back a bit further. You were bearish from May until June, basically for the month of June, bullish, went bearish again. You're back on the bull case. Right. Make it for us. Well, firstly, uh, the bull case is quite simple. Even, even the Russell is down 14%. When I was last here in May, I suggested the Russell should decline some 30% or more. Based on valuation, the Russell is the most overvalued index. For example, the OEX, the SP 100 index, is the most undervalued index. So it's clear that you could have a bear market in the low cap stocks, even though the, the big cap stocks may remain flat. And that was the case, basically. S&P, OEX continued up, while the Russell was down 14%. I think we're only halfway through the bear market in the Russell, but every bear market has rallies within the bear market. Mm -hmm. I believe this rally will take the Russell up, but not to new highs, but will take the S&P to new highs. So at the next top in the S&P, we, we will see divergences. But the S&P had a new high and the small caps remaining below the previous highs. So hold on a sec. You actually still overall feel bearish, but you think we're in a bullish pocket? Overall, I think the, we're, we're in a bull, bull market for the uh, big cap stocks. They should make new highs. But as far as the typical small cap stock, I, don't think, I think they made the highs early in the year. I don't think they will make new highs. So in addition to small caps being kind of the exception here within the broader market rally, are there any other areas that you're kind of weary of? Well, um, I'm weary of the economy in general. I, mean, I believe like David Stockman is writing in his book that ultimately this whole thing collapses on us. But that may, that may be a, a decade away. So at this point, I really like to take the market day to day. Mm -hmm. At this time, we're on a bullish move. Basically, what we saw was in, in October, we saw some major oversold readings. For example, we saw four, more than 400 stocks in the SP 500 were below where they were 30 days prior. That takes place at tradable bottoms. We saw the S&P 500 trade with 29 type, times as much volume to the downside as to the upside. That also takes place at bottoms. Now, we like to call the exact day of the low, which we did last February. We weren't able to call it this time, but we don't mind calling the lows four to seven days after the final low. Our indicators tell us that the most uh, typical aberrations that take place when the bull move starts is days four to seven after a low. Today is day six, SP up 1.4%. The SP is up today in high volume. That itself is a bull signal. On day four, the SP was up 1.96% in higher volume. That itself was a bull signal, mm -hmm. and that is what got us to, uh, to get fully invested. And we see major reversals. For example, I'll give you one indicator nobody knows about. Please. For, for the first four days of this rally, after the end of the fourth day of this rally, the S&P, 470 of the S&P stocks were making new four-day highs. Four-day highs. Only twice since 1967 did you see 470 of the S&P stocks make new four-day highs. And what happened after that? Market sense? continued higher. In each case, never made a new low. So that's another reason to be bullish. So we look at various indicators, which gets us to have confidence. All right, let's break down conditions. exactly where to be bullish. Let's go names. Tesla. Tesla is a great growth stock. It's still, uh, it's still uh, not accepted by the street. There's a lot more to go on the upside. What do you mean it's not accepted by the street? Well, people, I mean, people, I mean, last week, Graydon Carter called Elon Musk the Thomas Edison of our generation. Yet, people are in love with this guy. They love with the guy, but nobody believes that the typical American be willing to drive an all-electric car. They still believe they're going to drive hybrids. So if you notice how, how markets are at a stock works, Tesla may be overvalued, but it may be overvalued until its final high. And the way to know that, it, that it's topping is when more of the public, more of the investment public believe in this story. And I speak to many people in the business, both the hedge fund business and the retail business, and no one believes the Tesla story. So it's because there's still a lot of skeptics really? out there. Really? Really. Doesn't that surprise you? It does, given how the stock has moved. But what really surprises me, uh, I guess it shouldn't be surprised, given that you're such a contrarian, is BlackBerry. You're long hey, on what, BlackBerry. Why does that surprise you? Why? Because no one uses it anymore in the passport. The passport that they just came out with as, was derided as, as this crazy, crazy appliance. Help me. Well, I love the BlackBerry. Well, you see, you're talking to me on a fundamental basis, and I really start off on a technical basis. Most okay. of my clients have big, big fundamental shops, fundamental research shops. So I say, I'll give you a list of 52 stocks to look at, and these, these stocks should do well technically. You could ask your fundamentalist for the reason behind the move of the stock. Just to let you know, BlackBerry has outperformed more than 92% of all stocks over the last 12 months. Are you for real? I don't know why. Let the fundamental people tell us why. I just know that it's a... So John Chen doesn't have anything to do with it, or he may. It doesn't he may, matter either way. It doesn't matter to me, actually. Uh, okay. GoPro. 
GoPro. Well, GoPro it came up on my list. Usually we don't like to get into new issues. Why? Well, because uh, new issues very often have a lot of hype in it, and ultimately they, uh, they collapse. And GoPro's got a lot of hype. But since it was on my screen, and it's one of 52 stocks, you know, as a basket, it's a great stock to buy. I believe the fundamentals are great. They're, they're unique in the industry. They have many new innovations. And it's in, on my screen, it's one of 52 stocks to buy. But it doesn't have a long trading record, right? I mean, it, it only went public recently. That's so true. you don't have a lot of history to That's look back true. on and, and compare. Let me ask you a very, very technical question. Most of my, uh, my models use at least one year of data. Mm -hmm. It showed up on the screen because of the five-day rates of change over the last three months or the last six months, and that was sufficient to get onto my screen. But normally, my screen wouldn't pick up on a stock that has less than one year of data. Since you're model-based, screen-based, when the market completely falls out of bed, when we end up in the credit markets in just liquidity freeze mm -hmm. last week, what happens to your screen? What happens to the models? It well, goes haywire. Not really. As far as the stock models, our models were telling us, get ready to buy. All the panic we saw on Wall Street was giving us type of indications that suggest you should buy stocks. Uh, for, uh, for example, we saw 80% um, of the, of the S&P 500 at new 30-day lows. We saw a trend reading. I don't know if you're familiar with trend, but trend measures the volume of stocks relative to the rate of change of, of the stocks. Okay. And trend was at two, in Nasdaq, at two extremes of trend that you haven't seen since June of, of 2012. I'm glad you bring up volume because that has been a concern over the summer. There was so much complacency and people were saying that they're not really participating. Last week kind of jolted things up a little bit. We got some volume. Now we seem to be going back volume into a is again. Phenomenal. Let me tell you what, what I found here. Volume is great. Let me tell you why. Last week we saw the highest volume on the New York Stock Exchange on a five-day basis in over a year and a half. Now you'll, you look at the history of the stock market since 1900, you'll notice most trading points take place when the five-day volume of the New York Stock Exchange is the highest in at least a year and a half. That was another evidence that we're at a turning point. Now the reason is when, when you see high volume, you want to be on the other side of the volume. Mm -hmm. You see high volume going up, like August 11th, 1987, five-day volume was the highest in the year and a half. That was the top of the 1987 bull market. When you see five-day volume at the highest in the year and a half, as people are panicking to the downside, you want to go counter that volume move. You actually want to buy. And that was one of our get ready to buy signals. And with the up move we had a couple of days ago, and today's up move, that gives us the buy signal. Now, the reason we got long yesterday, actually, as a trader, we would have gotten long a couple of days earlier, but we have clients who follow our advice. So we got, we got bullish the day before yesterday. The advice was to buy on the following day. Do you we want to give them the, the ability to buy. Are you focused in any way on the Fed next week? Oh, the Fed is terrible. I mean, we should not have a Fed. There's no reason to have a Fed. We should have competing currencies. See, you ask why I like when Milton comes on. This is why. Not, what do you think about the Fed next week? It's the terrible. Fed is terrible. Well, there were, there were, 13, uh, <laughs> Shouldn't have there were 13 recessions in the 100 years before the Fed. And there were only seven recessions in the 100 years post the Fed. However, the growth, the total growth of that 100-year period before the Fed was far greater. And believe it or not, some had a dollar in the bank 100 years before, it, for those 100 years, it was still worth a dollar. Some had a dollar in the bank in 1916 when the Fed started. It's maybe worth a couple of pennies today. Hmm. So the Fed hasn't done their job. The Fed is now creating funny money. And ultimately, there's going to be a collapse one way or the other, either deflationary or inflationary. At this point, there are many deflationary pressures. We don't know where the ultimate well, uh, collapse Passive is. investors who've been in the market since March of 2009 would argue otherwise. But, but what I want to know from you, since you're a technicals kind of guy, how much has Fed intervention changed the way that you analyze your charts? Well, does it? Fed intervention affects markets, and I analyze the markets. So if the market's going to act bullishly because of the Fed, I don't really care if it's because of the Fed. I just care that the market itself is acting bullishly. If the market is acting bearishly because of Fed tightening, I don't really care that the Fed is tightening. I just care that the market is acting bearishly. So you're not really making allowances for it either way. But what I am doing is I understand economics because I studied economics in the past. And yes. I will tell you that the zero interest rate policy has done nothing to this economy. Interest rates would be at 0% work for the Fed, work not for the Fed, because we have deflationary pressures. Okay. During deflationary pressures, interest rates are 0% on the short end. Then what should the Fed do? I get it. You don't like them, wish they didn't exist. That's not happening anytime soon. Well, so the world, according to Milton, what would you like to see the Fed well, do? Well, if, if the Fed wants to goose the economy, the only way it can do the economy is by printing more funny money. Once it, if, when the tape but what break, does that do for the real economy? It, oh, it's terrible for the economy. The Fed never says they care about the real economy. If they cared about the real economy, they care about old people who have money in the savings bank and are forced to buy stocks, forced Chase to buy long-time bonds, chasing yield. Ultimately, it's going to hurt them. But the Fed is, is uh, the Keynesian, and the Fed just cares about spending rather than saving. And the Fed wants spending. They're going to have to put more money in the economy to get people to spend. And that might not even work because the, the economy is so saturated with debt, auto debt. Uh, my children have, uh, have uh, college, college debt. debt. 
government debt. So saturated debt, creating more credit doesn't really, really do much anymore. So ultimately, this is going to collapse. But at this point, let's be bullish for the next rally.